Welcome everyone to a session called A Right-Centric Approach to Blockchain Applications. I'm Sheila Warren. I'm the head of blockchain and data policy here at the World Economic Forum. And I am very pleased and honored to be joined today by two special guests. We've got Aya Miyaguchi, the Executive Director of the Ethereum Foundation, and Seven Waterhouse, CEO and co-founder of Orchid Lab. Now, these are obviously uh, big luminaries in our space, so I'm very pleased to have them here today. We're here to talk today about rights-centric approaches. What does that mean? Well, the forum about a month ago released a document called the Presidio Principles that really attempted to put on paper some concepts, some values that we thought were really important in terms of preservation of the principles of decentralization in a way that really spotlighted and focused on participants within an ecosystem. And we're grateful that Ethereum Foundation and Orchid Labs have signed on as signatories to those principles, which means that they are examining those principles and how they might apply to the work that they support in the ecosystem. I'd love to hear from each of you in turn just about what attracted you to this concept in general, this notion of a right-centric approach. Aya, let's start with you. Uh, sure. Thanks, Sia. Um, I, well, we, you said that we signed up for this, but um, we are, what well, the Ethereum Foundation doesn't really make applications. So I want to be clear on that. We're more like, we support the idea of creating principles for applications to um, think about what they have to do to protect users. But again, like we don't, so that's, that, that was something that I discussed with Oregon and Clolam that <clears throat> we don't, we, you know, we, we can sign for this, but we don't really build applications. We're more like we encourage community members to... Exactly. Yeah, look into this. And what does that mean to you? Like when you're talking about that encouragement, what is it that you, uh, you think people should be doing? Um, yeah, so... When you, what's the, one of the challenges when, when talked about this was really when you say blockchain principles for blockchain applications, depending on what type of blockchain uh, you are using, it is, it is very different and what to watch. And also users have to consider many different things, including the list of things that you had this in, in this, on this principle. But for especially for the public blockchain that that Ethereum is, it is it, it could be very confusing. What the user like, even the definition of user is different. Um, but even without that, in general, blockchain is still very new technology. It's hard for users to understand when when they start using an application. They have to know what they are getting into. Um, so I think uh, the education is necessary there. That's why um, we we were happy to support the idea. So, Stephen, what does it mean to you to design something with user protection as a guiding principle? Oh, thanks, Sheila. And first of all, thanks for um, <coughs> including us in this and, and this uh, panel. Um, yeah, we, we've uh, thought about these things um, very carefully. We started the company uh, about three years ago, and I've personally been in the space since early 2013, uh, started uh, Pantera Capital back then. So I, um, I thought a lot about these issues around privacy and security especially, um, but also uh, the, the concepts you also bring in around transparency. Um, in our system, which is a, uh, our initial application is a decentralized VPN, um, we've had to think very carefully about how we explain to people um, exactly what is happening uh, in our system. Um, we're built um, using Ethereum. So <clears throat> clearly with that, uh, with that situation, we have a pseudo-anonymous uh, blockchain. It's not an anonymous system. Um, and so thinking through how uh, we um, actually add anonymity into that um, through various techniques and uh, explaining the things the system does and does not do um, has been very much uh, paramount and important to us in our designs. Um, and I think that um, it's, it's important as people are building new applications. Um, I kind of think of this a little bit like 
it's similar to things like uh, the GDPR and the and the one in California where we're um, adopting a set of principles that um, you guys are recommending and Ethereum Foundation signing on I think is a is a is a big step because people do look up to the Ethereum Foundation as to see you know what what kind of things they recommend to do. Um, and I think with this new paradigm, this new technology stack, this new framework for building applications, having these principles in place is, is very important. So Aya, I know that you um, were very grateful. You've agreed that the Ethereum Foundation will be issuing a guidance document. So the principles I should note are aspirational in nature. We did draft them with the idea in mind that it would be really, really hard to meet all 16 of the principles uh, at this point in time. They're meant to be kind of a guide, a north star, but as you correctly noted, depending on the protocol you're building in, there'll be different ways of instantiating or implementing these principles. And we've been lucky that various uh, protocol of uh, some of the VCs are going to be issuing guidance documents in the forthcoming weeks that really help ground these principles in more concrete kinds of actions or provide a little bit more meat, if you will, around some of the principles that are uh, at times a bit high level. So I'm curious if there are things that you'd choose to highlight from the Ethereum Foundation's guidance document, uh, which we will be releasing uh, this week. Yeah. Um... So, like I said, some user rights require more efforts to protect depending on the type of blockchain, which is why it was hard to have universal principles. Um, so that's why uh, we, we decided to publish the extra guidance um, specifically for Ethereum. Um, I, I expect you know, others would, would do that too. Yeah, and obviously transparency naturally occurs more easily with public blockchain. Um, and for privacy, participants should understand the data that goes through a decentralized blockchain system is generally that is final and also ac uh, accessible by anyone, right? So the way with like builders, meaning like it's, it's hard to even uh, with that decentralized system, it's hard to separate users and providers of the service. That's very different when you build things on a permission blockchain. Um, you know, you you like who are users, who are providers is is more clear. And the application is a platform for uh, with the decentralized blockchain. The application is a platform for participants to interact. They can be users of, or providers. So that is in, in the general business structure. That's why uh, we kind of have to explain the builders of the application should be clear with, with users or, I mean, users, again, can be a service provider on the mm -hmm. application. Participants. Or, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But it... it when, when you build an application, um, they should be clear about the benefits and potential risk of decentralized applications and where trade-offs may exist. Um, and examples include user privacy versus public, uh, you know, user privacy and public verif uh, verifiability and the natural conflict between, you know, like, immutability on on-chain data mm -hmm. and the user's right to be forgotten. So that's something that we added on the guideline um, because there are things that, that when you build an application, when you design your application, you should consider that, but also you should explain as much as possible to, mm -hmm. pa to participants um, yeah, of interesting. those trade-offs. Yeah. Yeah, so, so one thing that we talked about, so uh, Aya was a uh, part of the, the drafting committee on this and review committee on this document as a member of our Global Blockchain Council, and thank you for that. And one thing we discussed at length was this notion of users versus participants and a rec a recognizing that user as a frame is not always the right way of thinking about participants in a blockchain ecosystem. And so we actually deliberately shifted the language away from user to participant. But I think that participant-centric rights doesn't have quite the same recognition uh, in this space. Yeah. So it's interesting to see the places where we do wind up equating user or participant where they are actually distinct concepts. So uh, thank you for, for highlighting that yet again. It's one of the things that we also talked about and that kind of the impetus for this entire 
uh, development of these principles in the first place was our Global Blockchain Council is comprised of very strongly opinionated uh, very uh, views in the space, uh, as many are familiar with, uh, that represent everything from skeptics of blockchain technology to people who are you know, hardcore Bitcoin maximalists, a different protocol, we had enterprise, we had government, and coming together and building consensus around a document like this one was obviously a huge challenge, but it was very important to us to layer in those different perspectives to ensure that there was an element of universality to this. But one of the underlying goals that we all agreed on was that blockchain technology attracted most of us, or if not all of us, for similar reasons. The concept of decentralization, disintermediation, these notions are very powerful and they provide certain kinds of benefits. And if you build on top of such a protocol, a very, very centralized application, it's not that that is a bad thing, that's actually fine, but it does merit a discussion of the trade-offs there. And it does lead to conversations around whether or not um, rooting your application in a decentralized protocol is the right thing to do and makes sense. So it sounds to me like what you're saying is that you're trying to highlight in the guidance that you're going to issue shortly the trade-offs there. So talking about some of the trade-offs that we know in the space that are trade-offs that exist in other places as well. But in our space, it's really this notion, you know, privacy and security and how you kind of think about where you're able to leverage the benefits of decentralization and where you may have to compromise some of those benefits in order to obtain perhaps a higher level of security. Is that an accurate reflection of of what you yes okay yes definitely I and mean, also uh related to what you just mentioned i really appreciate your putting together this group of opinionated <laughs> <laughs> members that are it's because it's like we try to categorize this into blockchain but it is hard to have universal yeah. uh, standards, but it is also important for for general public to even uh, be interested. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so for example, like related to the privacy, um, like, like you know, like because, because seven you're here, like for for a product like Orchid, it's you're you're providing a product that is basically to protect privacy. Uh, which is, you know, a VPN service, but it is it is not easy to accomplish that with a decentralized system because that that is the hardest part. There, the you know, the privacy protection technology exists now, and then you know, our researchers in the community are working really hard to improve that uh, to to improve within this decentralized system, but. That is that is a big challenge for you know the, the service like yours to accomplish, and then also it is something that you probably need to explain more to your users. Is is my yeah, assumption? We, so, yeah, we um, it's interesting trade off. Yeah, you the, the we gain privacy on the IP level, which is on the network traffic, um, by using uh, multiple nodes, multiple hops in our system. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, we're then using a public or pseudonymous public blockchain. Um, so then the question is, how do you how do you kind of get one benefit without losing um, the benefit of? I mean, I, I'd argue that uh, you don't really have necessarily have payment anonymity within a standard VPN system anyway, because you're using giving credit card information, and VPN companies have a very sketchy. Uh, many of them very sketchy history of uh, selling user data and so on. But in in the best case scenario, you could you could potentially design a VPN system and centralized thing, which wouldn't give you the IP level anonymity, but perhaps would be you know better on a on a uh, payment layer. Um, with uh, some of the new systems we've been um, working on, where um, <clears throat> we uh, we do we, we've been building an in-app payment framework um, for. Uh, for enabling, uh, it's going to be coming out quite soon, uh, enabling fiat gateway connections uh, to ORCID so that users don't have to um, interact with dApps and um, ORCID tokens and Ethereum for gas and all these things, which it, it is still there, but it's it's kind of complicated to, to use. Um, even the design of that, um, we had to think very carefully because there are ways to do that where you build a sort of semi-centralized wallet, which some other applications that have been growing have done, 
But people don't really realize what they're doing when you use that kind of payment technology. You're, you're basically sending all your data to a central point. And yes, you're still using a decentralized backend for certain things, but you know, if you're kind of using like video streaming or something like this, it's like kind of confusing to the user as to what's actually happening. So we've attempted to be very transparent with these things while also designing something um, where when we say it's private at a certain level, because there's a kind of a spectrum of privacy, it's hard to be, it's hard to say you've got like universal privacy on every single thing. Um, you need to kind of explain which things you're trading off. Um, with the new system, there's a lot of improvements um, there. Um, and again, then there are trade-offs as well. So we, we've had to, we're going to have to explain those things again. Um, we've been trying to design our system uh, not just to be decentralized, but also to be something which um, doesn't require us to be part of the loop. Like all of our technology is, is open source and people can can run different, different aspects of it in, in whatever they want. Um, and then also explaining to people what the levels of privacy they're getting when they're running it and, and, and when they're using it. Um, so I think that's there, something I've been saying for a while now is, is that because uh, we've looked very, very hard at this intersection between privacy and decentralization, um, is it just because you have a new architecture which is decentralized doesn't necessarily mean you absolutely universally then get some aspect of privacy. Um, if you take uh, central, central bank digital currencies, Mm-hmm. Some of these actually have exactly. like much better exactly. tracking capabilities than, than than just cash. So yeah. uh, it's it's not a panacea. You have to you have to think through the principles as as we're doing now as to to how you're building systems. Yeah, and I think this exactly illustrates the reason why we thought these were important. And I think I think again, you know, our our view at, here at the forum is is we are neutral and objective and keeping with our friend, but we don't necessarily think that it's a bad thing to have an, even a CBDC, for example, that does enable maybe more surveillance. It's just about being transparent about that and giving, uh, you know, I wouldn't say like the average lay person, but certainly the average participant, uh, be a place to kind of grab onto to understand what's actually happening and to get a kind of orientation to where uh, those trade-offs are happening and what it actually means for them to participate in the ecosystem. So uh, we, we basically divided the principles into four different buckets. These are transparency and accessibility, agency and interoperability, privacy and security, and accountability and governance. We've talked quite a bit about privacy and security, but I'm curious of the other three areas, transparency and accessibility, agency and offered interoperability, excuse me, and accountability and governance, where do you see the biggest challenges when it comes to building applications on top of a blockchain-based system? I guess let me rephrase it this way. Where do you think is the most opportunity, like, I would yeah. say, right? Like, yeah, so not, not so that it's hard, but where we haven't really, because I think in privacy, we do understand the general matter. We have, a, in part, um, Seven, because of, of products like yours, we do understand a little more what that intersection looks like, what the trade-offs look like. Where do you think there are, I don't want to call them, you know, traps or complexity, but something that we don't talk about as much, is not as well known, you know, whether think, well, even within or outside. Yeah, go ahead. The, the, the principle we use on transparency and accessibility is that um, whilst, you know, we could say anything, right? We could, we could, we could say, oh, our system does X and Y and, and yeah. you know, who knows whether we're telling the truth. But because the systems are open source, what we're working on doing and what we're hoping that happens is that, and this is still already happening, is that um, the sort of like extremely technical, passionate people will unravel the system and actually determine whether or not what we're saying is true and then run it themselves and test it and so on. So transparency and accessibility should be, um, should fall into place. And, and then the, using the open source and, and the principles and looking at how the system is constructed, um, as long as it's not like incredibly complicated and people just get tired of trying to figure it out, which, which probably would mean to, to a system that wasn't successful because it's like, um, when people ask me which VPN to use, well, now I say Orchid, but in the past I would say, well, you know, I know these guys at this company, so you should use that one. And that's kind of how a lot of people mm-hmm. understand very technical things initially. Um, and if you're using, um, you know, a particular video streaming platform and someone says, oh, no, those guys aren't good because they're doing X, Y, and Z, yeah. then you might not, you might think again and try using something else. Um, I think to me the opportunity actually is in uh, the agency and interoperability. Um, mm-hmm. And I think just uh, thinking through how people 
really get to own their own data and transfer it between different systems, whether those data is embodied in cryptographic keys that are controlling funds or controlling data. Um, and this is quite different to the standard model that we've thought of for, for decades now of building a moat around a centralized system and just locking people into it. Um, if you take something like the gaming space, trying to ground this in an example, um, the, instead of building something like Fortnite where you say, I'm going to try and make as much money as I possibly can until the next thing that beats me comes along. What if you were able to move your cryptographically controlled assets, whether they were skins or other, some other kind of things that you collected or earned during the, during the system, and then move them onto another version of Fortnite? The, the standard thing you would think is, that, oh, well, that's going to lead to less value created inside Fortnite, but I actually believe that it's within the open source framework that actually leads to more value in the end for the actual framework, for the actual system. And so I think this is an important thing if you kind of ground it within certain areas like gaming or other things, just one example, that helps you understand why these things are not necessarily just good for users, but actually good for the ecosystem in general. Yeah, really interesting. I'd love to get your thoughts. Yeah, um, since we are both... Um, Seven and I are both from the Ethereum side. It is, you know, like I think it's public cross chains opportunities. Definitely the, the first, I don't know, first two or uh, in, in the principles is transparency and accessibility and the agency and interoperability. Those two are definitely opportunities for um, a public blockchain. And, and, you know, like, like he just mentioned, but you know, like you even this inclusiveness of uh, one open source technology, but also there is no even definition of users. Like you can be that that builder of application can be just a provider of the application, but mm -hmm. they don't have to be part of the, the transaction, and that is a huge huge opportunity. Um, if, if we you know look at, at from that side and. Um, and then because of the transparency that there are a lot of things that um, I think um, I am actually very excited about a lot of public use cases that are happening, including you just published this Columbia e-procurement use case that used uh, Ethereum and also a hybrid blockchain. Yeah. The plan transparency is, is even more needed now, especially with the COVID situation, people are that are getting more skeptical about, yeah. you know, what, what governments are doing or what my, my money is, how my money is being used or more, not just skeptical, sorry, and more, more cautious or more pay, paying more attention to that. Um, that's why I think the need of blockchain technology, but also especially public blockchain technology, it is, is there and we're already seeing the use cases. Um, and that's something that excites me, and that's something we are we've been excited about. But it is more exciting that we actually see those real use cases happening now. Yeah, yeah, and thanks for for raising our Columbia e procurement uh, project. We're obviously really proud of it and excited about it. And I think the thing for us, the the premise of that project at the beginning was really this notion that transparency in and of itself, just making something more visible, doesn't really that's not the end. You know, you, if you don't have um, almost a user guide to what are you seeing? What does it mean? You aren't empowering the right people to do something with that information. There isn't kind of an accountability mechanism built in. Then like, what's the point? Transparency is not the end game in and of itself. There has to be yeah. some kind of concept of what that transparency could lead to. And so part of what we try to do is think about what policies ought to accompany some of these more transparent applications in ways that particularly could hold, in this case, uh, those engaging with procurement within a government um, accountable and think about that as well. But I want to shift us a little bit kind of on that note into just a broader conversation really about, you know, surveillance, about uh, this kind of dystopia that we're, that we're sort of seeing, like, you know, uh, more rapidly approach us as a result of this pandemic. And, and just in general, you know, I think, I think you're right, Aya, there is a lot more awareness by the average citizen of some of the things that have been happening behind the scenes. Uh, that being said, I think that we still tend to default, even in as creative and, and sort of uh, visionary a space as we are in the blockchain space, we still tend to default to kind of um, our existing silos and systems. 
And so this is kind of to your point, right? We tend to think very much in a zero sum way about like, well, if I, my Fortnite, you know, uh, um, skins and things aren't held here, like why would I want to think about the entire ecosystem being lifted up and being made better? And this is, I think, a peculiarly American phenomenon. It's not quite the same in other parts of the world. So I don't want to discount the cultural component of this. But I'm curious, you know, where you see that um, happening the most. Like, what are ways, even in your own thinking, where maybe you've caught yourself or you've kind of seen, you know, uh, places where you're like, oh, I'm still getting kind of caught up in the notion of the system as it tended to be. And I know both of you don't really think that way. So I'd be curious if there was a moment where you made that transition where you thought, I don't have to start, I don't have to think in these silos, I can really think about the entirety of a system. And I think it's not a coincidence that you both wound up in a public, in Ethereum, right, and in, in this space, as opposed to many of the other opportunities that availed, uh, that you were availed of at the time that you both got here. So I'm just curious to hear what that kind of moment was for you when you realized we could think in a different way, in a way that might actually better benefit society. Hmm. I think, um, do you want to go first? <laughs> no, go ahead, go ahead. No, yeah. Um, I think I mean, it's like uh, I was working on decentralized uh, systems back in the early 2000s, like kind of yeah. pre cryptocurrency, um, more systems based in Spider and Napster and Nutella. Um, but it wasn't really till, till like early 2013 when I started thinking through Bitcoin and what else you could do with it. Um, because, um, you know, the, 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 the Ethereum crowd will sometimes try and think that they were the only ones to think of smart contracts. But we were thinking about smart contracts a couple of years before Ethereum came along. Um, but, uh, you know, Ethereum just got it right. Um, thank God. Uh, but uh, the, um, the, the thinking process then was really just like, what could you do? Could you build the, the systems I was very interested in and we invested a lot in at the time um, were sort of banking systems for developing nations? Like, could you, could you leapfrog? Um, the same way that cellular left, did, did a leapfrog between having no telephone systems to having telephone systems that were just cellular without having to wireline, could do the same thing with banking. Um, and I think um, as I've thought through applications over the years, um, the thing I try to do a lot of is think about, instead of thinking, let's take this application that was successful in a centralized way and decentralize it, let's think about the unique benefits of decentralization and yeah. the benefits we've looked at have been uh, sort of like, as you talked about surveillance is like centralized points of control um, with banking, Bitcoin decentralized that, you know, d disrupted that. Ethereum really disrupted many things. Um, originally uh, the sort of centralized point of funding for projects instead of the old boy club in Silicon Valley, which I'm kind of part of, but uh, could, could you, could you decentralize that? Um, with ORCID, we've been looking at the, the concept of decentralized points of control of communication, whether it's surveillance and censorship. Um, and I think DeFi is becoming like a new space too, which is, yeah. which is providing some lot of insight there. So why, why would people want to do this? And what are the exciting parts of it? Um, so I think it's been, for me, it's been a gradual thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, me too. It's interesting. I and mean, I do think that there's this, like you said, there's a tendency, the way we digitize things, it's, oh, we'll just take this thing and we'll digitize it. Mm -hmm. And then great, it's better. You know, we'll take this centralized thing. We'll decentralize it. Great. That is kind of step one. And then when you really kind of move beyond that frame, that's when it, I think it gets really powerful. I, I'd be curious to get your thoughts. And I'm just mindful that we we're nearing our end time. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I, there was no one single point, but I, you know, I was born and raised in Japan and I was also in education. I was a teacher in Japan. I always care about social justice. I'm not like I'm so my parents I, sort of like they raise me in the way that I like we always question uh, everything, but question like just because there are big authorities, like is it really right? Or so I was always like that. But also, uh, you know, like in, in my in my in my MBA, my focus was microfinance. That's when I actually met Bitcoin in 20, like I heard of, about Bitcoin in 2011. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, okay, this is, this is really, we really, should really, really, really that could be totally useful for in, in financial inclusion. Uh, and then anything happens and uh, that, that actually, you know, open up this, this opportunity yeah. is a lot bigger. Yes, but it, regarding you, like, you know, against the, the existing systems and still like, like how the society works. 
I I see the challenge every day because it's you know mostly we, we spend our energy mostly on that unfortunately yet and uh, so that's why we feel the need of education. Um, so I appreciate your work and um, so I also see that, that this is an opportunity now that people are more paying attention to this is a good good timing to educate people more about like what does privacy means like why do you have to care why do you have to yeah. care about security and privacy something like people maybe like depending on where you are you may not have have to um think about it yeah i well, i think i i i always love hearing people's journeys so i appreciate that you're sharing those insights with the audience and with me um, so I'll just note that I think it's very clear we've come a long way on this journey as a community. There is a long way yet to go. There's a lot more we can do uh, to kind of make the world a better place. And we are hopeful that the Studio Principles will help to serve as a guide and anchor for those of us who truly do care about realizing the potential of decentralization uh, so that we can have as much societal impact as possible and change the systems that have been excluding many parts of our society, many citizens, and make them more inclusive. So thank you to both of you, Aya, Seven. Much appreciate your time here today. And with that, uh, if there are questions, uh, please feel free to uh, put them in the chat and we will be uh, releasing the guidance document that Aya mentioned along with a couple of others in conjunction with this session. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.